in 2016, actually February to be exact, Doug and I, the co-founders of 1951, held our first refugee barista training program. This two-week class includes times where we invite volunteers from our community in to help our refugee uh, participants practice, kind of as a mock customers. And our very first customer and our very first class was Balav, who's a former refugee uh, from Bhutan that Doug and I had been working with in the refugee resettlement community. I was so excited when he showed up, I had to commemorate the moment with a selfie. Um, but Balav was even more excited, and he exclaimed to us, I can't believe you're doing this. When I first came to the US 15 years ago, oh, I loved coffee shops, and I always wanted to go in, but I was too nervous. I didn't know how to order coffee. I was scared I would embarrass myself. And it took me a couple of years before I finally actually went inside and had a coffee. And once I did, I realized that inside the cafe was America, and that I wanted to be a part of it. And as our friends so rightly observed, to many, the coffee shop is American society. And we have the power to transform that cafe and the coffee industry to be the society that we want it to be. I've worked in refugee resettlement since 2011, and both Doug and I have seen that we need to start shaping our society to be more welcoming for refugees. And that's what we've done at 1951. We've tried to create a convergence point where we can invite the community in to learn who refugees are and be part of the process. So, talk about refugees. Across the world right now, there are over 20, or there are 20.3 million refugees, according to the most recent reports from the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. But that's a mouthful, so everyone in the industry calls it the UN Refugee Agency. This is a huge amount of people. It's about equivalent to the entire population of Australia. And the word refugee is not just a noun, which is why people use the word fairly carefully, but it's a legal definition. And it means, well, first of all, it was set at the 1951 convention held in Geneva, Switzerland, where our name came from. But the definition means that it's someone who, owing to a well-founded fear of persecution based on reasons of race, religion, nationality, or membership in a particular social group or political opinion is outside his or her country of nationality and is unable to, or owing to such fear, unwilling to avail themselves to the protection of their home country. Of this 20 million refugees in the world right now, only 0.5% will get recommended for a settlement in a third country by the UN each year. That's roughly only 100,000 people, and it is almost always the most vulnerable of this population. That you know, recommendation doesn't come quickly. It comes as an average 17 years wait time from the moment someone left their home until they get resettled in a third country and can start their lives over. Once the UN recommends a refugee from resettlement to the US, the US begins an extensive security and health check process that is conducted by these, oops, sorry, six organizations or US government agencies. There's a big debate if this population is well vetted. Trust me, they are. This security check process takes about one to two years in addition on top of that 17-year wait time. And it's extremely thorough. Once one has passed through the security check process, their case is added to a pool of candidates that are presented to nine different resettlement organizations that are contracted by the United States government to conduct the program across roughly 200 cities in this country. I want you to consider for a moment what a refugee's you know, trip has been like to this point. They fled their home country, so fearing for their lives and the lives of their family, and then a refugee resettled in a second country seeking refuge for an indeterminate amount of time, average time 17 years, before they once again can go on to a new life. A refugee is only notified of their travel plans and their final destinations two weeks before they set out. At this point, they're provided a brief orientation of what life will be like, and they set out across the world, which for many will be on their first plane ride ever. And at this point, it's when a refugee really begins to dream and hope for the future ahead. Wouldn't we all? That's what we're on a plane to do. But they're seldom right, like, prepared for the next challenge that awaits them once they get to the US. So the US government that runs or contracts the refugee resettlement program provides about a $1,000 per person payment to the resettlement agencies per person to help a refugee start their life over. 
This is the same amount in any town or city. So if I'm sitting in, you know, Moline, Illinois, or I'm downtown Seattle, the person's going to get the same amount. And this money must be used to provide housing, furniture for that housing, skills, or sorry, supplies, food, clothing, and some money left over for spending. So you can imagine, that's absolutely not enough. And because of how the program is structured and this really tight economic moment, a refugee must be immediately connected with employment once they arrive in the U.S. Employment is so critical that social, cultural, and linguistic needs are not addressed in any significant manner as part of the resettlement program. The U.S. government expects this refugee and their family, who we invited to this country, by the way, to be economically self-sufficient after being here for six months. And that sounds like a bit of time, but in reality, that means that a refugee must start paying their rent in full after being here for two to four months, and they must start repaying the price of their plane ticket that brought them to the U.S. after they've been here for six months. That's right. A refugee, their plane ticket here, is made by a loan that hits their credit report to the refugee, and it starts, they have to start repaying that at six months' time. So even though I keep building up to employment, and employment is so important, it is not easy to find. It is another huge crisis moment for a refugee. When they, you know, common barriers they face is a lack of U.S. references, a lack of U.S. job experience, English language limitations, education or certifications that U.S. employers don't understand or simply don't trust, and the inability to wait for long hiring periods for one to get back into their chosen career. And what can often happen is that a refugee doesn't secure employment or insufficient employment to pay for their financial needs. And at this point, it's a huge psychological impact and one that we've been privy to and seen a ton in our lives. They are at a point of despair, and a refugee and their family find themselves now additionally financially unstable and socially marginalized. You know, in working in refugee resettlement, this, this is a common challenge. We, we see it, we know it, and we have worked with people who are really trying to make a solution, trying to make a difference. We've seen organizations donate large checks of money, donation drives, advocacy efforts, and those are good solutions, but they keep the benefactor comfortable and they keep the problem at arm's length. So the question I pose to you all is that we, you see we have a process for resettling refugees, but do you think we are welcoming them as a society? Because I don't think we are. And, you know, I've been at fundraisers additionally where I am talking to people who are personally donating thousands, if not tens of thousand dollars, to refugees over there. And I'd be like, yeah, I work, I work for the office in Oakland, and they're floored. <laughs> like, they're, they're refugees here. I'm like, yes, actually, there, there are refugees we've settled in the U.S. every year in our community that we could be helping here. And so, you know, the, this question I posed to you about refugee resettlement is one that our society is grappling with as well. It goes without question that this country and other countries across the world are locked in a very public debate about what we are going to be for refugees moving forward. And, and our resettlement is a long tradition we held and hold in America, and one that our melting pot, you know, one that we stand proud on. And so I think we have to start, and that's what you know, we're here to talk about, and Doug will expound more on, of what we can do to start crafting society to be more welcoming for refugees. Professor Stella Tingtumi, an interculturalist at Cal State Fullerton, has spent her 36-year career looking at the way that cultures interact. She's proposed two common ways that cultures normally receive newcomers. The first of these is cultural assimilation. Cultural assimilation expects the newcomer to conform to the host environment. That means, in this case, that a refugee has to leave behind their own identity, adopt a new self in order to be welcomed. The second of these is cultural pluralism. In cultural pluralism, there's a, a wider diversity of, of values and norms that a newcomer can choose from. This means they can maintain their own identity while merging with a larger mosaic. She goes on to say that the more open or the more pluralistic a society is, the easier it is for a newcomer to adapt to that society. 
Here's a model of what the integration process can look like. When a refugee enters society, they begin on the margins of society. They're an observer. Their interaction with the larger part of society is minimal, and they're looking for that place where they belong, trying to find a way to come in. Now, after they've mastered a certain set of cultural norms or expectations, like learning the English language, then the larger society invites them in to become a participant in society. Now, in a cultural assimilation model, this would be where, where things would end. They would simply be a participant along with, with everyone else. But there is one more stage. This is a stage in a place where culture is created. Now, again, in that assimilation model, this would be locked away, frozen in time, usually in some golden era. But in a pluralistic model, this stage is still open. This is the place where culture is created. And in a pluralistic model, the newcomer is invited into that space to become a collaborator to be a creator, along with those already there, to shape and to reshape that culture. Now, when we started in 1951, we knew that the cafe was positioned in an influential place in our society. That space between home and work, between home and school, where a lot of life happens. It's a place that has the ability to influence our larger mindset. And so in the cafe, we have the opportunity to exemplify what welcoming refugees looks like. We can invite refugees into our cafe and allow them to stand side by side with our community members as peers. We can hire refugees to work in our cafes as staff members and allow them to build authentic relationships behind the bar. In 2007, when I first started working in the coffee industry, there was a young man hired to work alongside of me. I didn't know at the time, but one day over lunch, he shared with me his story about how he came to the United States as a refugee. And that story changed my life, and it set me on the path to do what I am doing today. And furthermore, we can invite refugees to become creators, to collaborate with us in our companies, to be a part of shaping where we go in the future. And this is why we chose to work in the specialty coffee industry. We designed our organization around enabling refugees to move from observers to participants, and from participants to creators. We knew that refugees faced the barriers that we mentioned before in finding employment, and so we started a refugee barista training program. It's a 40-hour program spread out over two weeks. This program introduces them to all of the basic skills that they will need to begin to work in the specialty coffee industry. Since early 2016, we have graduated 40 baristas from 15 different countries. Many of them have begun working in the Bay Area in our growing number of partner cafes. Ten of them began working with us in our own cafe. In our cafe, we embrace our differences. We talk about them. We have trainings so that we learn together how to navigate those differences. And ultimately, excitement is our go-to emotion when we meet something new. We encourage all of our baristas to be creators. Recently, two of our baristas became senior baristas, and we have allowed them to take charge in the day-to-day -day operations of our cafe, in our social media, in our new beverage creations. We're allowing them to influence where we are headed. This is the kind of foundation that we want to continue to lay one that is an entrance into a new career that leads to a new life here. Serendipitously, our cafe opened in Berkeley on January 22nd of this year. We never could have imagined the confluence of geopolitical events that would happen at that time. This was three days before the first failed travel ban. But it immediately proved to us something that we knew about the cafe, 
that it has power in our society. So when people began to look for a place to show support for refugees, they found us. And they came to our cafe and they talked with our baristas. They sat in our space and wrote letters to their elected officials. They strategized around ways that they could go out of the cafe and make a difference in this situation, all while sitting with us drinking a cup of coffee. In the specialty coffee industry, we continually seek to combine quality coffee and the value of humanity across our supply chain. Welcoming refugees is another way that we can do that here, where we are. We have the ability to offer refugees those dignified work opportunities that they need at their earliest and most crucial period in their resettlement process. And when we can create and carve out a clear path for them to be creators, not just in our companies, but in our society. I want to introduce you to some of our colleagues. So are you going to be off tomorrow or what day? No, no. No I'm working. No. Right? What's yeah, up with you today? today. <laughs> <laughs> like one is kid, we play in the jungle, the soccer, right? Yeah. And after that, we get wet and uh, muddy. Mm -hmm. We went in the, we take our ball and throw in the, all the guys yeah. and get the ball. Yeah. So much fun. So fun. And sometimes we go all the way down, down, down in the jungle and we get a fresh uh, water yeah. nice. coming from the jungle. It's fun, yeah. It's yeah. really fun. I'm from Syria. I have been here from four months. My name is Tedros. I am from Eritrea. I have been in the United States for almost one year. I am Moyat. I am from Syria. I have been to the United States for four months. My name is Lebe. I am from Eritrea. I have been here five months. My name is Mona. I'm from Iran and I've been in the US for six months. My name is Nazira. I'm from Afghanistan and I have been here four months. I am a journalist. I am a cook. I am a son. I'm an engineer. I'm a human. I'm a refugee. How do you say your name? Uh, Tedros. Tedros. Yeah. Okay. Nice I'm great. Nice, yeah, nice to meet you. Was it for Jimmy? <laughs> I am from the happiest country in the world, Bhutan. But I was kicked out in 1991 along with my family and 100,000 Bhutanese because we are not a Buddhist and didn't speak the official language, Janka. We are Hindu and spoke Nepali. Bhutan is well known for its measurement of gross national happiness. Before this was put in a place, my family and those like me were forcefully kicked out of the country because we are different. A place can measure a happiness when those who aren't happy are asked to leave. My father, a documented survivor of torture, was in prison for four years. Simply, he joined the March for Democracy and Human Rights. My mother fled to Nepal with me and my brother. At the time, the UN refugee agents, at the time, the Nepali government didn't want to support us and give a land. So the UN Refugee Agency came in and rented the land from Nepali government to host Bhutanese Nepalese in seven different refugee camps. Having our citizenship cancelled by Bhutan and not welcome by Nepal, we were stateless people. No citizenship, no home. I lived in Goldap refugee camp for 19 years. 19 years. Our camp was 1,400 thatch and bamboo hut with almost 10,000 people. Those house we built by ourselves with the supplies provided by Lutheran World Federation. 
Each hut was about 200 square feet or roughly the size of soccer goal opening. As a family of four, we slept, cook, study in the same space. No electricity, no running water. The World Food Program provided all our foods since we are not allowed to work in Nepal. They provided each person with a small amount of needles, garbage beans, potatoes, pumpkins, onions, and five kilograms of rice, which is often mixed with the sand, stone, and a brick for 15 days. To get meat, milk, clothing, and other supplies we needed, we would often sneak out of the camp and work illegally. At age six, I started school. Classes were roughly eight hours each day. We walked to the school near our home. I completed high school in Blooming Lotus English School. The school is sponsored by Caritas Nepal. As a kid, it wasn't bad at all. When we weren't in school or studying, we would play a soccer, a ball made of plastic, paper, and cloth with my friends, and the ball is made by ourselves. The ground was not open like the earlier. We often had trees on the field, but we could use the trees as an extra defender, which was really fun, and I still miss it now. For those 19 years, the UN Refugee Agency tried to find a permanent solution to our situation. We survived by floods, storm, diseases, and social problems. In 2007, the fire destroyed our entire camp. By that time, the UN Refugee Agency tried, decided third country settlement is only the solution to the Bhutanese. By 2008, people started to leaving for the United States. It took me two and a half years to go through the beating process. My parents left first and were resettled in Oakland, California. I joined them, in, I joined them six months later. When I first arrived in the United States, I thought about going to college. Even though I realized I completed high school in, Blo completed high school in Nepal, I need to get a GED. I need to find a job. I was put in an IRC employment program, which helped me to search for a job for four months but I wasn't able to find a job because I had a lack of experience, my English wasn't great, and no reference. I walk around the San Francisco, hand out the resumes, go to the interviews, but never get a call back. I met Doug while he was roasting coffee at Booth Coffee Consulting and bulletin at IRC. He knew I needed a job, so he allowed me to come and package a coffee so I can make a little money. I never imagined that I'll be working in a coffee in the future, to be honest, but I did really like the smell of coffee. Finally, I got a job at a pizza place. It was on a very dangerous part of Oakland. We had a security glass between us and customer of six inches thick, but I needed money and experience. I continued looking for other opportunity and got a job at New Chipotle opening in San Francisco. By this time, Doug was working at IRC and I wanted to go and help him to find jobs for new refugees. Based on my experience going through, I helped Doug and IRC team to develop a Chipotle training class. And this class laid the foundation of what became 1951 Coffee Barista Training Program. During this time, I was balancing other parts of my life. My girlfriend, now my wife, was resettled with her family in Vancouver, Canada. You will think it will be easy for me to be with her, but as a refugee, especially a stateless refugee, it is nearly impossible for us to travel to another country. She was close but it's still very far away. It took me one and a half year to get my green card and travel to see her, <coughs> but by only car, because I had no password. On September 21st, 2016, 
the happiest day in my life. I became U.S. citizen. I was very emotional. Until the age of 26, I wasn't a citizen of any country. Can you imagine? Until the age of 26, I wasn't a citizen. I felt like I had found my identity. I immediately think for my kids. They didn't have to wait to find this part of themselves. When I first heard about 1951 coffee, I thought it was a cool idea, but it will be hard to accomplish. They asked me to come and work with them. I was really excited to work for a non-profit and support refugees. I knew it will be difficult for me to work in coffee because I never worked in coffee shop before. I didn't know how to make a drinks. I was also nervous to lead the group of people as a senior barista. When I first started the training, I had a fear that I couldn't do it, but remember the previous experience and think I could learn it and be good at it. The good thing about the training is they made it easy. However, learning to do latte art was difficult and is still finding it difficult to me. <laughs> <laughs> now, I've been leading our barista team for three months and I see our new barista and know how lucky they are to have a, have a place like this. This place makes them feel at home. At 1951, you not only learn how to make a great coffee, you learn how to be a better person each day. I work with the baristas from seven different countries. We have many experience, and those experiences we share motivate and encourage us. I'm proud to lead our team, and also very happy to advocate for refugees in the larger community. I want people to see the importance of helping refugees. We have many stories to share, and those stories can make our whole community better. The coffee industry is positioned at the center of American society. This industry can take the lead in making America a, making America a place of welcome and empowerment for refugees. We can do more than simply having a cocktail party fundraiser, or receiving a donation, or sharing stories by social media. As a refugee, I'm inviting you in close. I'm a real person. I'm not a picture on the wall or a website. To the degree that we welcome refugees today, we lay the foundation of receiving more refugees in the future. You welcomed me in 2011. Today, I work in a coffee industry as a new American, welcoming a next generation of refugees. I invite you all to join me. Thank you.